Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I want to talk about NASA's new job opening. They are looking for a planetary protection officer, which sounds like, quite possibly, the coolest job title ever. If your name is Flash Gordon, this sounds like your line of work, right? Well, not really. It's not about saving the world from killer asteroids or invaders from Mars. It's really more about making sure that there is no biological contamination crossing from one planet to another via those space probes that are trying to investigate the planets. So there is actually an international treaty which the US is part of whereby uh, we promise to make sure that we don't contaminate potential extraterrestrial biospheres. Uh, and that would basically be anywhere where there is potentially liquid water. That includes Mars, Europa, Enceladus, and possibly a few other locations in the outer solar system. Now, obviously, these are pretty extreme environments, and indeed, deep space is pretty extreme. You know, if, what could survive crossing thousands of, uh, thousands, millions of miles on the surface of a spacecraft? Well, you know, we look around Earth and we find life in the most hostile places. We find life sitting next to hydrothermal vents on the bottom of the ocean. We find life literally in solid rock two miles underground. There is life living and thriving in pools of radioactive toxic sludge. And so if it can adapt to that, it could potentially adapt to a biospheres all over the solar system. Famously, when the astronauts of Apollo 12 visited the Surveyor spacecraft, they took the camera back and it was found that there was life that had survived its trip to the moon. Now, there's some question as to whether the life had actually gone up there with Surveyor or had been brought along by the Apollo astronauts, but regardless, you know, the life was on the surface of the camera, it survived hard vacuum, hard radiation, and had come back to life. There are even more complex things than bacteria. If you look, there's something called tardigrades. They're little water bears. These things, you can freeze them in liquid nitrogen, you can desiccate them, you can put them in a vacuum, hit them with radiation, and then you add water and they spring right back to life. These are the kind of things you would not want to introduce to an inv other environment because astronomers are really fascinated by the possibility that life might exist elsewhere in the solar system. And if you're sending a very fancy spacecraft to one of these potential locations to analyze what's there, you really wouldn't want to bring along con some contamination that would ruin your experiment. It would be rather embarrassing. The Apollo spacecraft, of course, also had the famous qu uh, quarantine facility. This was uh, used for the first three missions that landed on the surface. That would be 11, 12, and 14, because 13 never made it to the surface. After the mission, they were concerned that astronauts might bring back some sort of crazy space flu, and so they put them in a quarantine facility for a couple of weeks. It was basically a converted Airstream uh, caravan. And uh, yeah, after that, they got to come out. They stopped using it after the first few because they figured out that since nobody had got sick, then it was very unlikely to actually uh, be a real problem. But yeah, the Office of Planetary Protection is more concerned with contamination going in the other direction. Now, sometimes spacecraft go out uh, on various missions and they find themselves in the vicinity of bodies that they then later discover may have water. And this is the case for Galileo and Cassini. The Galileo went to Jupiter, it orbited around for a long time, and then, of course, they were pretty convinced by the end of the mission that Europa could have a subsurface ocean. Therefore, since the spacecraft hadn't really undergone any decontamination procedures, they made the decision to deliberately crash Galileo into Jupiter. That, that way they didn't have to worry that after the fuel ran out that they would lose control and it might eventually end up crashing into Europa or perhaps some other moon of Jupiter that could harbour life. Similarly, Cassini recently has been orbiting very, very close to Saturn. It's been diving inside Saturn's rings and giving us some great images. But this is part of the end of mission plan, which will involve crashing Cassini into Saturn for exactly the same reason. It did land a small spacecraft on the surface of Titan, but um, you know there's other locations that we wouldn't want the Cassini spacecraft ending up. Now on Mars, things get kind of interesting. We have two rovers there right now, of course. We have 
opportunity and curiosity, but neither of those have been sterilized to the highest standards. And so that means that while we've seen images of space of these water flows on the sides of uh, craters and things like that, the rovers have not been sterilized sufficiently to allow them to get close enough to these. In fact, when they find places where there is potentially water, the rovers are actually required to stay well away from them. So, uh, you know, future rovers may be sterilized to higher standards. Incidentally, sterilizing, if you don't know, involves all sorts of scary chemicals that will do their best to kill uh, any life. Then they'll bake the whole spacecraft in an oven. And then, of course, the couple of months that it spends in space and hard vacuum and radiation probably finish off anything that's left. So there is actually a committee that uh, has drawn up guidelines for this. It's called COSPAR. They do many other things, but the Committee for Space Research they have created five classes of uh, missions and the different levels of uh, contamination. Like a class one is going to the sun or mercury. There's basically not going to be any biological activity. Don't worry, don't sterilize your spacecraft. Class two, not really, uh, is, is kind of one step up. It's things like Venus. You're probably not going to have anything interesting going on there, but just there's some remote chance that there's something might be uh, worry to worry about. Class 3 is for missions that fly past targets which are potentially sensitive. So they do require some level of uh, you know decontamination and they also require that the maneuvers and everything be you know include biasing to make sure that if something goes wrong that they won't crash into the target. Class 4 is basically where we get into interesting areas. So class four includes Mars, Enceladus, uh, and all the other locations that have liquid water. Mars actually has three levels. There's class 4A is for landers that are, aren't going to look for life. Class 4B is for landers that do look for life. And class 4C is for landers that go to areas of special interest, which basically is anywhere we've seen evidence of water flowing. 4C is what, well, 4B is where, you know, your curiosity and your um, opportunity are. They can't go to the regions with water. Category 5, you might be wondering, well, that is for sample return missions. That is contamination potentially happening in the opposite direction. And then, of course, you need to make sure that not only is the spacecraft decontaminated for going there and getting the sample, it then needs to be very careful how it returns the sample and make sure that it's protected all the way down so that it doesn't release the sample, it doesn't contaminate the sample. This is like the ultimate, ultimate... Uh, version of your classifier of your you know of your restrictions right however let's be clear the solar system has been around for like four billion years four or five billion years and in that time it is very likely that asteroids hitting the earth have they've been large enough to knock pieces off and accelerate them at a low enough rate that there could be chunks of rock with life living inside them. And then it's entirely possible these chunks of life of rock with life still inside them could end up on other planets. This is called panspermia. It's entirely within the scope of probability that uh, life on one planet would spread throughout the solar system via this mechanism. So the contamination may already have happened. On the other hand, of course, the timescales for these things mean that uh, any evolution would ensure that the life had diverged quite spectacularly in that time. So even if we did find that life on Earth had contaminated Mars by, by you know, natural means, it would be an amazing scientific discovery. And that's what all this is about. This is NASA trying to make sure that someone is responsible for telling scientists, sorry, you can't do that experiment right now because it might ruin future experiments. You know, a planetary protection officer is there to disappoint a lot of people and make sure that the right experiments happen in the right way and the good data is what comes home. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.